Well, hey, Vision. Okay, have you had any situations lately that have tested your patience? Test your patience, like, oh yeah, oh yeah. You've been, you've been anywhere lately that truly has challenged you to either to be positive or negative. You come into some situation, like, boom, instantly, you got to decide. Am I going to be positive? Am I going to be negative? In fact, did it happen at any of these places? Maybe have you lately been at one of our favorites, the fan favorites, the DMV? And you're in the DMV, and you're like, okay, this, this is going to teach me something today, the DMV. How about if you go to the mailbox, you pull out a letter from a good old friends over at the, uh, or, or, and you're like, okay, whoo, how am I going to react to this thing? Or, or maybe a long day in Charlotte, been working, you're just ready to cruise on home, and next thing you know is you, you find a parking lot waiting for you on 45 or 85 and it's testing you, it's challenging you. Or personally, one of the most uh, challenging things for me is if you go into the freezer and you go to pull out something and what you find is an empty <laughs> container of ice cream. You're like, what is going on around here? And you gotta decide, how am I gonna react to this? And say, okay, a lot of life is about our attitude, right? It's about our attitude. If you're, uh, if you're a person who likes quotes, if they help you, you wanna get your phone out, I got three quotes for you. All right, first one here. If you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. As I say, a lot of life, we can't change it, but we can change our attitude. Okay, number two. People may hear your words, whoo, but they feel your attitude. They feel your attitude. And this last one really is one of my favorite quotes in life. From Chuck Swindoll, it says, life's 10% of what happens to you. And honestly, it's 90% how you react to it. So today, we're thinking about attitude. We're thinking about the DMV. We're thinking about traffic. We're thinking about that person, that situation that threatens to take us somewhere we don't want to go with our attitude. We're continuing our series called Cow Tipping. And if you're new here, then this series, let me unpack it for you. Because honestly, guys, today... The cows are coming home. You ever heard that before? You go, when the cows come home, hey, today the cows are coming home. Okay, this is part five. And we've been talking about these things in our life that sometimes we put up as idols or literally sacred cows that we're not going not gonna to talk about, not deal with because they just, they're there. We can't really fix them or move them. They're too big. But God says, don't have any idols in front of me. And you say, okay, Pastor Matt, I don't have any idols. I've not taken gold and fashioned it into something. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a sacred cow in our life that mm, I'm not, not going to talk about the fact that my life purpose, it's about me. It's not about God's purpose or really my self-image. Remember week two, we talked about the fact it's not really even how I feel about me or how you feel about me. It's about how God feels about me. We talked about our career, whether we're a, a student and that's our career or a, a middle age, or even if you're retired, you're saying, okay, my career, my time, the way I spend it, it's my choice. It's my decision. And God says, no, no, don't, don't you put that sacred cow in front of it. He said, I'll knock it over. I'll take away your career. God says, it's supposed to be about how I want you to use your time and use your life. And then last week, whoo, man, I saw people walking out here with some toes been stepped on because God talked to me and talked to you about our stuff, right? Our possessions. And God says, don't you put your stuff in front of me. Don't you say that that car, that house, that paycheck, that job, it's more important than me. God says, mm, that's a sacred cow. I can knock that over. And in fact, I, I want to give out some of these not so sacred cows and Chick-fil-A stuff and all that. So if you've got your takeaway card, pull it out. And if you are one of the, uh, the chosen few that have an orange smiley face on your, uh, your takeaway card, who's got an orange smiley face on there? Orange smiley face. I hope somebody does. Uh, Jack. Jacqueline's already won? Well, then, Jacqueline, you get one of these, and just like last week, then you get to give it away. So why don't you take that? Jacqueline, wow. Either she's lucky or the, the connection team likes her, and they say, man. Okay, who else has one? Somebody in the back has one? Who, who, who else has got a smiley face? No other smiley face. Well, then, man. Well, then we'll give it away in the second service. Okay, take that. No. But I have had people asking throughout the series about how do I get one of those cows? The way you get one of these little cows is you come to church and you stand there and you put your hand up and say, Pastor Matt, I want a cow. And I take it, I throw it and wherever it lands and people don't fight over and fuss over and Matt Curry, really, in the front row? Well, Matt, this one's not for you. So <laughs> there's a way to the back there, way back there. And we got one more cow. Anybody who's been here for most of the series and said, man, I wish I could have gotten a cow. I really want one. I see, 
Catherine in the back, it's a bigger one. It's like, yes, good catch, good catch, Julia. Way to be there for your daughter. Good catch. So we can laugh about this and say, hey, cows, that's funny, and Chick-fil-A, that's funny. God says, it is not funny if you set up sacred cows that keep you from getting my best, that keep you from living the life I want you to live. God isn't knocking these cows out of the way because he's mean or he's mad. It's because he says, Jamie, I want something better for you. I want something better for your kids. I want something better for the people who watch you. And so we talked today about attitude. This is a big one because specifically, we're gonna talk about negativity. You say, well, Pastor Matt, I'm, I'm just naturally pessimistic. I'm just kind of naturally negative. I mean, I'm a realist. Listen, negativity is a choice. When you're at the DMV, when you're st stuck in traffic, when the, the ice cream container is empty and you're kicking around the kitchen, like, no, negativity is a choice. Our attitude is something we can shape. And so today, I'm going to tell you a story, <coughs> excuse me, a story. And actually, my cough connects with the stories. This is really interesting. I'm going to tell you the first part early and the last part late. Because this story about what happened to me this week, and this is, this is always interesting as a pastor, I always got my antenna up say, God, what kind of life experiences are you going to give me that I can use in my preaching? Well, Thursday morning, it happened. So Thursday, I'm at the doctor. I had gone to the doctor about 10 days before that. Go to this doctor. I'm not going to tell you which doctor and not going to tell you which practice. But this doctor, I go in to see him, whatever, a week and a half ago. And uh, he says, got the cough, you got bronchitis, let's give you some prednisone, go. So, you know, I go home, take the prednisone, I get a little bit better, and then it still just hit this plateau, which evidently it's not gone. Okay, this has been six weeks now I've had this cough. So I go back on Thursday, see this doctor, you know, he takes my shirt off, he's like, Ooh. <laughs> I was kidding. But he, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> he takes the shirt off, checks out my lungs and stuff. He says, yeah, you still got it. I said, you're good, doc. You're right. I still, I still got it. And uh, so I'm breathing. He's here crackling. And I'm like, he says, let's do a little uh, breathalyzer thing, uh, um, nebulizer. Put this thing on, put some juice in it. It's, whew, okay, breathing, feeling a little better. He comes back in the room and he says, uh, okay. I'm going to give you a prescription to go get one of these little machines and the juice and, and uh, some more of the anti-inflammatory prednisone. I say, okay, well, just, so tell me, Doc, what, what is the prednisone going to do? And he says, well, I just told you it's an anti-inflammatory. I'm like, Ooh. I kind of feel like a little, little hint, a little attitude there. I'm like, okay, I just, I'm just trying to understand why I'm going to take something I just took. They didn't fix it. And I didn't say any of that. I just kind of listened. And uh, so he goes and he gets a little piece of paper and he writes it down and he comes back in. And uh, I say, hey, Doc, um, if we wanted to test and see if it was an allergy or a fungus, how, how would you do that? He says, no, 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 it's, it's not that. You got bronchitis. I said, okay, well, just what if I just wanted to find out what the test is? Is it an x-ray? Is it a, a shot? Whatever. He said, look, I've been doing this for 30 years and you have bronchitis. I said, well, Doc, I've had it for six weeks. He says, Matt, you're not the only one who gets a cough for six weeks. It's going to be okay. And I'm like, I said, are you insulting me? And he said, well, actually, you're insulting me. I was like, whoa, <laughs> okay. We touched a nerve in this doc because I guess I asked a couple questions. It gets worse. I'll tell you that at the end. Okay, I'll tell you that. So hang in there. All right, now, today, though, I will tell you the story at the end. But today, we're talking about joy. We're talking about attitude. We're talking about those quotes we just read, and you're in the doctor's office or in a traffic jam or somewhere, and you got to live this out. Because in Nehemiah 8.10, it says, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. You're like, joy. Okay, joy. What does that mean? Joy of the Lord would be my strength. I mean, a lot of times I'm thinking, I'm my strength. You know, my family's my strength. My health is my strength. And Nehemiah writes and says, actually, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Okay, I want to understand that more. Galatians 5.22, this guy, Paul, this guy, Paul, never underestimate how powerful the words of Paul are because this is a guy who was intent on killing Christ followers. And then later he ends up giving his life for Christ. I think, man, what happened to this guy to change him so much? What happened was he saw who Jesus was. Jesus literally spoke into his life and said, Paul, you're missing it. There is a better life, a different life for you. Paul changes, 
He gets God's spirit inside of him and he writes things like in Galatians 5 where he says, if you are a Christ follower and therefore have God's spirit inside of you, then you will have fruit or literally a display of the spirit in you. He says in Galatians 5, the fruit of the spirit is joy. There's five, six, seven things he says, but one of them he says, you can have joy, you should have joy if God's spirit's inside of you. And I'm like, really? In the doctor's office, when I was been called down, I'm supposed to have joy? Paul says, yes, you're supposed to have joy. And in the third verse, Paul writes to a different group in Thessalonica, and he boils it down simply. He gives them a couple of different things there. He says, rejoice always. And you're like, Paul, you don't understand. You don't understand. Sitting in 85 in the traffic, or when my kid did this, or my boss said this, Paul says, rejoice always, pray continually, Give thanks in everything. Give thanks in all circumstances. Like, okay, I can do that. We got Thanksgiving Thursday. I can give thanks. I could probably even pray a lot. Man, rejoice always. He said, actually, this is God's will for you. This is God's best for you. This is almost God's dream for you that you would be a person that can have joy no matter what happens. No matter what the person says, no matter what the situation is, no matter what the doctor's report is or what the bank account says, God says through Paul, you can always have joy. Okay, so what's joy? Let's, let's try to boil this down. Because if you look in a dictionary, it talks about joy being a state of happiness or great pleasure. We're like, yeah, my team won. I'm joyful. You know, I got a raise. I'm joyful. I got Thursday and Friday off of work. You know, I'm joyful. Okay, yeah, it means you're happy. You're kind of situationally, circumstantially happy. I can understand that. Some of the synonyms. Satisfaction, comfort, gladness, elation. <coughs> Excuse me. You're like, okay, I can understand that. I can have situational happiness and call it joy, but there's something different. For those of us who follow Christ, who like Paul, we said, this guy, Jesus, don't miss this. This guy, Jesus, he predicted his death and he predicted that he would come out of the grave and he did it. A person who does that, I am listening to him. Okay, I'm listening to him. So when I look in the Bible, it says, you can have joy, not circumstantial happiness. You can have joy always. What does that mean? Well, to me, Christian joy is, is something more, it's, it's, it's in our soul. It's something that the Holy Spirit puts in us because of what Jesus did for us. That Jesus, we sang about that, that reckless love, that he would go and light up shadows for you, climb up mountains for you, kick down walls for you. And literally he did that. He kicked down walls and came after Katie and said, I'm coming to get you. I'm going to save you. And we think about what Jesus did for us and it's rooted in us with the Holy Spirit. That is a, literally a feeling, an emotion, a truth in us that God says, you can have joy always because of what Jesus did. Now, okay, has anybody ever been watching a baseball game and somebody strikes out and they go to the dugout and they act like a fool? I mean, they act like something I would never let my kids do and they come in here with a baseball bat and they're pounding and they're hitting, they're kicking coolers. I was watching some of them this week so I could really internalize it. One guy even smashed a phone and smashed the phone and smashed the phone and everybody in the stadium's like, ha ha ha, look at him. We don't act that way. Jesus says, don't, don't act that way. Don't let your attitude be, okay, this is a sacred cow. I'm just, I just got a temper. I'm just short. I just, be, because of my dad, because of my upbringing, because this happened to me, because of who I am, I'm allowed to do that. As a Christ follower, we're not. Because we have a deeper joy in us that overcomes anything. Now here at Vision, we want to tell people about that. We want, to, we want to invite people into that. I'm going to show you a short video. This is a, I guess, a vision commercial, if you will, that we're going to start putting out in social media that you can grab and share and share and say, come in here. We've got something different. Check this out. Come check out Vision Church, where you will feel welcome from the moment you enter the parking lot, and our host team will take great care of you every step of the way. If you have kids, this could possibly be the best hour of their week. Kids love the way we use music, 
teaching in small groups to help them experience God's love for themselves. Teenagers worship in the main service and also have special events designated especially for their generation. Our worship service combines music, relevant teaching, and creativity to help you connect with God, maybe for the first time ever. Check out our Facebook page or website. We would love to hear from you or see you on a Sunday real soon. Okay, that's what we got here. We've got joy that we want to share. And when you see this thing start popping out next couple weeks, particularly as we head into our next series called Encounters, that when you encounter God, you're never the same. We get this joy. Now, I want to make this real um, uh, relatable so you can remember this this week. Um, Would anybody in here like to go to Aruba? Okay, free trip to Aruba. Free trip to Aruba. Okay, so repeat after me. Think of Aruba. Come on, with, with heart now. Think of Aruba. Aruba. Okay, this is, this is going to help because, listen, you remember last Monday? I was talking to Michelle. Michelle was out feeding at the ranch on Monday, cold, rainy, dark. I was thinking, Lord, bless Michelle Geither. She is out feeding at the ranch tonight. Terrible weather. It was awful. I'm thinking, okay, if you this week have a day like that, cold, rainy, and if you knew that in two weeks that you had won a trip to Aruba, in that cold, rainy day, they're like, how are you smiling? I said, I'm thinking of Aruba. Okay, I'm thinking in two weeks, I'm going to Aruba, so today, it really doesn't matter. Or what if, you know, your kid comes home, and, you know, they, they got suspended. You're like, oh, man. my kid got suspended, and, but you, you don't go off. You don't blow a gasket, and your kid's like, why are you not losing it today, Dad? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of Aruba. I'm thinking of Aruba, okay? It, whatever happens today, it doesn't matter, because I'm going to Aruba. What if the, you get something in the mail to IRS? And you're like, oh, normally Kevin would stress over this. You're like, Jamie's like, Kevin, why are you not stressing? Say, it doesn't matter what happens today, because in two weeks we're going to Aruba. Okay? You're, lo- you're thinking ahead of something better. You're thinking ahead of something that is promised to you that is coming, that can help you in that moment. So say it again. Think of Aruba. Think of Aruba. Think of Aruba. Okay, because this week... When something happens at work or something happens on the phone, you're like, I'm going to blow a gasket. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. What Pastor Matt say? Think of Aruba. Think of Aruba. And you're like, I'm not going to Aruba. I have something that, that's better than Aruba. Let's look at this. This story. This story in Acts 16, these guys. These guys, who I think were very similar to us, Paul and Silas, I think they woke up one day and they said, God, I would love to see you work in my life today. Would anybody in here ever have a day where you wake up and say, God, I would like to see you work in my life today. I'd like to see you do something in my life. I'd like to see you work in me or through me. Honestly, if you're even adventuresome, you might say, God, you know, use me, stretch me, challenge me, whatever your prayer looks like. I think these guys, they woke up that morning and they said, God, would you work in us and through us? And if you want to even imagine this, and I encourage you, when you, read, when you read the Word and you look at stories in the Bible, try to think about some of the, maybe the, the information that's not included in text. I think these guys, they might have already known a guy who was known as the jailer. They probably didn't like the jailer. They probably didn't like the way he treated people, the, the things he did. But I just wonder if they, if their hearts were big enough that maybe that morning they even prayed and said, God, do something in us today. Do something through us today. Hey, Joe, the jailer, I pray that you would do something in his life today to show him the love of Jesus. And you're thinking, Matt, how does that relate to me? This totally relates to you. That you have the opportunity in your life to get up in the morning and say, God, would you do something through me today? Would you work in a way that I see you do something powerful, meaningful, impactful, even if, and this is where it takes guts, even if it if it costs me a little bit of something, that I'll pray for Joe the jailer or the guy at work or the lady at school or the neighbor or the situation. God, do something in me and through me today. And God says, that's the kind of prayer I want to hear. So then Acts 16, these guys, Paul and Silas, had been out preaching. They're out sharing with people about Jesus. They, they come across this girl who uh, was possessed. They pray over her. She gets freed of it. People get mad. People get ticked off. They drag these guys off to prison. 
and their day, to, to us, it looks like it's totally tanked. They're like, okay, well, this day's over. This is awful. Awful. What's my attitude going to be when my day looks awful? We pick it up. Verse 22 says, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. It doesn't make my empty ice cream seem so bad. It doesn't make gridlock and traffic seem so bad. It doesn't make my kid getting suspended seem so bad. They were stripped and beaten with rods. In my opinion, they kind of had a right to, to, to tank their attitude, right? To be negative, to be pessimistic, to be like, God, clearly you're not in today. We prayed for you to be in today. You're not in today. We've been stripped and beaten with rods. And it gets worse. Verse 23. After they had been, don't miss this, severely flogged, not just flogged. Okay, who saw The Passion of the Christ? That movie. That movie changed for me what the term flogged looks like. I'd always read it and thought, oh, someone had been flogged. Okay, they kind of get, they got beat up a little bit, kicked a little bit, whipped with something. You get tortured within inches of your death. And it said these guys not only were flogged, I mean, they were severely flogged. They were thrown into prison. The jailer, oh, the jailer pops in the scene. We'll call him Joe the jailer. Joe pops in the scene, and maybe these guys had prayed for him that day, that year. If they had a heart like ours, where hopefully at Vision, we got a heart, we're praying for lost people. We are praying for lost people in our life and saying, God, use us to impact them. Joe the jailer comes on the scene says the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. So they've been stripped, beaten, flogged, taken into jail. By our, by our account, they would have the right to be negative. The right to be mad. Well, it says, verse 24, when he, Joe, received these orders, he put them in an inner cell, made it even worse, locks them up. Feet, hands, whatever, and these stocks, whatever, they're locked up. Now they're in, I imagine, dark, wet, maybe a cold place, dirty place, locked up, beaten, hurting, hungry. It's all going wrong. And I'm thinking, man, I complain getting stuck in traffic. These guys had a day a thousand times worse than my day. They're in the jail. Okay, now, verse 25, about midnight. Now, if you're at a men's retreat, at midnight, you're playing basketball. Okay, that's what we do there. Man, it's crazy, right, Jeffrey? I don't know what we're thinking. In jail, you're probably trying to sleep. You're trying to forget about the pain. Honestly, you're cussing out the jailer. You're cussing out somebody. You're cussing out each other. You're mad at God. Who knows? In our human nature, that's what we're doing at midnight. It says at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, and you're like, oh, these are these seminary guys, these saints. No, they're not. These are just regular people. I guess with an irregular kind of faith, because they're sitting there at midnight praying and singing hymns to God. I think they were singing Reckless Love that night. And they were talking about, okay, God, we want you to kick down this door for us. And they're in there singing whatever they sang in those days. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Now, this for me is very humbling because in my moment when I have a choice about my attitude, it's not just about me. It's about who's watching. It's about who's listening. It's about who's saying, okay, that guy who goes to church, that guy who talks about the Bible, how is he reacting to the situation? And this phrase that uh, came to my mind before verse 26 is that the mindset, it precedes the miracle. Okay? So repeat after me. The mindset, mindset. Precedes, the miracle. precedes the miracle. Because a miracle could possibly happen, but God needed some guys with the right mindsets. The same guys who maybe, I don't know, 15, 18 hours before, I'm imagining we're praying, saying, God, do something in our life today. Show us your power today, God. Do something amazing. And God was ready. But he needed some people with the right mindset before he was going to do the miracle. So verse 26, 
It says, suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. And man, those guys said, come on, let's go. Let's get out of here. And on the way out, man, they kicked the jailer and they ran on out and head out in the streets and said, burn that place down. Man, we, got, we were done wrong in there. Come on, we deserve something better. Let's go, guys. And they ran on out and the story was over and they went home and went to sleep. And you're like, oh, thank goodness. Man, they got rescued. That's not what happened. The earthquake and the doors, and the chains. And they said, wait, God didn't say go. They had this mindset that they were waiting on God to see what he wanted to do. And for some reason, they sensed and felt God did not say go, and they stayed. So here's what happens. The jailer woke up. I mean, evidently, when there's an earthquake, and chains are falling off, you wake it up. When he saw the prison doors open, he pulled that sword out, was about to kill himself, and don't miss this. This man, I'm calling him Joe. We will never really know his name until we meet him in heaven. He was standing on the edge of eternity in that moment. He was literally a step away from going to hell forever. If they had busted out the doors and ran out in the streets and they were gone, this guy would have killed himself. And this is what we believe here at Vision Church. You go somewhere for eternity. You go to hell or you go to heaven based on what you think about Jesus. And this man was about to go to hell. And I'm, I'm just kind of reading into it. I'm also assuming his family was going to follow him down that path, whether they killed themselves or they got killed as a, as a result of what he did or the rest of their life. They never came close to God. This whole family was doomed for destruction in hell. In that moment, he pulls it out. And this is really where, honestly, the real miracle happened. That Paul and Silas had not left. That they had stayed. And it says he was about to kill himself. Because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't do it. Don't hurt yourself. We're still here. I imagine the jailer... It's like, what? Why are these guys still here? Why would you stay? If he dropped that sword and looked at them and said, why did you stay? You talk about an opportunity for God to work. This is the moment those guys had been praying for that, mo that morning, and they didn't realize that that's what they were praying, saying, God, when the moment comes, let us steward it rightly. And they did. And the jailer opens up his heart and says, What's different about you guys? And we flip down to verse 34. It says, the jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them. They never could have imagined that morning that just hours later, they'd be eating in the home of the jailer. The guy I assume they despised, were mad at, had no respect for, didn't want anything to do with him. They're in his home. They're eating with him. And you tell me in the verse, what was he filled with? What was he filled with? Joy. The jailer was filled with joy. The jailer who just hours before that had approved of their beating, had approved of their flogging, had approved of them being locked up, probably not feeding them enough, not taking care of them. This guy just did a radical change visibly. I mean, you talk about inside. This guy has now taken a step, no, not toward hell, but yes, into heaven. He has been saved by the power of Jesus. And man, you talk about a story to tell the rest of his life. When he talks about the earthquake and the chains and the guy stayed, I was about to kill and I didn't and I came to Christ and now I'm having the guys in my house and we're eating and, and don't miss it too. You, you see who else was affected? His whole household. During the, the prayer after the song today, David, who was right here, who led our team at the retreat and worship, he stopped by, he said, Matt, this is what happens when men come down to lead in worship. This story, this is what happens when Jesus gets a hold of one man's heart and he comes back to his home. And it's like Matthew coming back in his home where there's Cedar Grove walking in saying, Kirsten, kids, you guys, I'm bringing some people in, Paul and Silas. Oh, Silas, I just made that connection. 
That's his son's name. And they walk in and he's like, hey, Silas, meet Silas. And they walk in to talk and they're like, what's this Jesus? They're like, dad, what's different with daddy? And he's like, man, I'm changed. I'm totally different now. It's all different because of what just happened. And the family says, well, give us some of that. And Kirsten prays and the kids pray. And they're, they're well, let's get baptized, man. Where's the tub or a bucket or something? We're going to get baptized. And you're like, baptized, does that really matter? On December 9th, you'll see it matters that if you've accepted Christ and you want to be baptized and stand up and say, I'm different now, I'm made new. That's why you get baptized. And in this, this moment at the house, this miracle is just flowing over, this joy is coming out of these people like they never even knew what it was. This is not circumstantial happiness. This is something different forever. So I say, okay. How do we get that kind of joy, that Paul and Silas kind of joy, that when your situation is terrible, awful, that you don't just take the sacred cow away and say, I'm just going to complain about it. I'm going to be negative about it. Woe is me. You know, that's my life. That's how it goes. No, it's not. I will not accept that in my life. I will not accept the sacred cow of negativity when God has given me so much to be joyful about. So how do I get more of that? Here's what I think. Number one, we remember who God is. We remember who he is. We get in his word. We pull things out consistently that remind me about those things we sang about, about the way he loves us and the crazy things he do for you, Bill, and the way he rescued you and came after you. We get so much of this in us that we will not forget who God is and what he's like and what he's done. And that helps in that moment when you're facing complaining, negativity, or joy. We remember that. All right, number two, we interact with people of joy. Like we literally get shoulder to shoulder and eye to eye and do life with people of joy. I mean, me and Bill talk about this all the time. Law of association, right? People you hang with, people you run with, that's who you can become. You're going to be like them. Let's interact with people of joy. Now, we're starting this project. I talked about it last week. It's called Project Give It Away. So everybody say, give it away. Give it away. And we're like, hey, that's kind of fun to say. It's harder to do. So here's what we're going to do. Like Emma said, we're going to flex our generosity muscle through this project, give it away. We have selected seven people. They're, they're on this team. I'm going to introduce you to them here uh, on screen in a minute. This team, we are collecting your ideas about charities we can support with end of year gifts here at Vision Church. So my challenge to, to us as a church, we keep giving like we give to Vision. That helps run the ministry, take care of the bills. And you pray about what I talked about last week, generosity and sacrifice for an end of year gift. If you say, okay, usually at Christmas, you know, we spend you know, 500 on a family or 700. Well, pull back 100 or 200 or, or 500. My end of year bonus, man, it's you know, $300. Well, then maybe you take part of that. You put it into project, give it away. Because I can say this open-handed, none of it's staying here. None of it is staying at Vision Church. We're to put it all into one account, and this team is going to decide where it goes. Let me tell you about the team. Up here, we got from different age groups, Cassidy Schrader. She's in the family with Quentin and Ashley Carswell. She's in our elementary ministry. She is representing that age group, uh, preschool and elementary on this team. Up here in the middle on the right, Austin Kepley. He's one of our teenagers. Great heart for people. I trust him and Cassidy and their heart on our team. They're going to sit with us. Over here, we got Jacqueline Morton. I think she has connection with the president or something. But Jacqueline is in our young adult population. She's coming on this team, help us decide where God wants us to take this money and give it away. Second part of this team, we got some of our adults. We got Jeffrey right here. I love playing ball with Jeffrey. Love doing life with Jeffrey. He's new in our church. He's going to be part of this thing, as well as Donna. Donna Klutz, her and Doug are new to our church. Donna's on our team, and I definitely want one of our elders on his team. 
And that's Scott right there doing one of my favorite things eating. I think mint chocolate chip. Is that right, Scott? I love it. Scott and then myself. So there be seven of us on this team. And you and even our community has a chance to submit ideas through next Sunday. We come out of church next Sunday. Boom, it's done. And this team is going to meet next Sunday night to take these ideas. We've been getting them in by dozens. Local charities, national charities, or international charities. Submit all these ideas, and our team will work through it. And um, this isn't a rubber stamp thing. These kids, these teenagers, people on a team will all put in their input prayerfully to say, we're picking one international, we're picking one national, and at least one local, and probably some extra locals. So as we get this money in, if it's 1,000, if it's 25,000, we'll take this money from December 2 through 31. You send in your end of your gift and you uh, designate it for this project. And on the first Sunday in January, this team will stand up here and tell you where the money's going. And I say, those are the people I want to run with. People that have joy. I want to interact with people of joy. I want to remember who God is and it helps me also to remember joy. And then the third thing is to keep things in perspective. Keep things in perspective. This uh, years back, I had a friend who, he had a good friend up in New York and uh, Northeast that was dying of cancer. The guy supposedly had six months to live. And six months pass, he's still living. A couple more months pass, and my friend goes up to visit him. Had a day like last Monday. You guys remember last Monday, cold, rainy, gray. My friend goes to meet him for lunch. He's like, oh, this day, man, cold, rainy, wet. And the guy with cancer looks at him and says, man, this is the most beautiful, cold, rainy, gray, wet day ever. And my friend realized his perspective needed to shift. So for me, I need this perspective of, remember, Aruba. I'm going to think about Aruba. When something bad happens, something unfortunate happens, I say, okay, yep, that's not good right now, but I'm thinking about Aruba. Because in two weeks, I'm going to Aruba. And you're like, Pastor Matt, no, you're not. Man, forget Aruba. I got what Jesus did for me. That's what I'm going to remember. That these DMVs and IRS, and all stuff happens. And I'm not downplaying those things. Those are rough things to go through. Cancer, somebody dies. These are rough things to go through. But in that moment, instead of the negativity and pessimism and woe is me, it's I have got joy because of the Holy Spirit in me and because of what Jesus did for me. I can have joy. So if you would, repeat after me. Choose joy. Choose joy. Share joy. Because your homework this week is that for five days in a row, Monday through Friday, I want you to contact somebody, text, email, call them, and you send them a little word of encouragement. Hey, Courtney, I hope you're having a great Monday. May God's light shine in you. Hashtag choose joy. Hashtag share joy. Because when you do that, I'll see it does something in you where you say, I am going to choose joy. And I'm not just going to keep it right here so I'm joyful. I'm also going to share it. So I'm at the doctor's office and the guy gets up clearly insulted by me. A patient who asked, how would we test if it's an allergy or it's a fungus? He said, look, Matt, you're not the only one who gets sick for six weeks. You'll be okay. I know you're worried. I know you're anxious. I said, doc, I'm, I'm not anxious. I just want to know some options. And he stands up and gets his little piece of paper and shoves it at my chest. And I just kind of stand there. And he finally takes it and tosses it on the table and he walks out of the room. I'm like, okay, this has never happened before. And I see him go down the hallway about five or 10 feet. He goes in a little side office and I go walking down there. I get the piece of paper. I go walking down there. I say, hey doc. He turns around. I said, I apologize if I have insulted you. I just wanted to know how I would find out 
if this is an allergy or some type of fungus. And he gets this look. He looks at me. He says, look, I told you. I've been in this for 30 years. You got bronchitis. Now stop acting like a bleep, and I have to go see my other patients. And he walks right past me out the room. And I chased him down and knocked him down and kicked him. <clears throat> and it's like, and it's like those TV shows then where you're like, blah, blah, blah. you wake up and you're like, no, okay, that's what I wanted to do. Okay. And I go walk down the hallway to the front and the lady running the desk who I, I kind of knew her. I met her the week before and she lives in my neighborhood. And uh, I said, I said, ma'am, I just want to let you know what, what just happened. I give her the little cliff notes on it. Number one, so she'd know. And number two, so if he comes out there and says, man, this jerk, man, he just did whatever. I said, no, no, I, I, was, I was not a jerk. I told her, but she said, you want to return an appointment? I said, that won't be necessary. <laughs> no. And I left, went home, and if you know me, I'm not passive. On that basketball court, am I passive? I'm not passive. If anything, sometimes I'm too pushy. I'm too much for, for justice and for doing things right. There's sometimes you need to step back and say, I'm going to choose joy. I'm going to share joy. I'm going to live life differently because of Jesus in me. Now, before we pray, I want to invite uh, Penny Turpin. Where's Penny at? Penny, if you'd grab that box on the front row, because these boxes right here are kind of symbols of joy. This lady right here is a champion of joy. And Penny, if you don't know her, this is Penny Turpin. She heads up our Operation Christmas Child Project. And this box um, I picked specifically because when we were singing and I looked down these boxes and I saw in here that this is for a girl potentially up to 14 years old. And if you know anything about my family, you know, I, I sleep about 20 feet away from a 14-year-old girl. And I thought, what if I lived around the globe as a dad of a 14-year-old girl, and I was just hoping somebody would send some joy our way. And somebody did. Somebody filled out this box. We've had teenagers at our church raising money to fill boxes. We've had senior citizens, everything in between, to fill boxes so that some 14-year-old girl is going to get a little slice of joy. And this isn't just about toys. This is about taking and saying, God sent this to you through us, through people of joy that we remember who God is and we interact with people with joy and we have a perspective that's different and we just give it and say, joy. So Penny, why don't you, real quick, you tell us why, why do you do this? You put in tons of hours. First of all, how many boxes are going? At last count, it's 217. 217 boxes. That's amazing. I do this because one, like we sang earlier, God's blessed me and it's been so good to me, but also because I've heard the stories of how each one of these boxes it's not just for that one 10 to 14-year-old girl. It's for her, her family, her community that not only get this moment of happiness, but they get to hear the good news and the greatest gift of all of Jesus Christ as their Savior. And there may be things in here that she can share with friends and family that don't get to come to the packing party because not everybody in the community does. But she'll have the opportunity to share. We heard a, a testimony this year. 17 years ago, this lady received a stuffed animal. That stuffed animal, she was overjoyed when she found it in her box, but it went on sleepovers to all of her cousins and friends. She still had that puppy dog and showed it to us, and it looked like it was in brand new condition. 17 years later, and not only that, she had a letter. She started pen palling. And she that planted the seed for her to accept Christ. That's what it's all about. These gifts will bring them that moment of joy. But that story that they get to hear about Christ and his gift for them, that's what it's all about. So great, isn't it? And if you want to uh, still be a part of this, take it a team on Friday, is that right? Friday from 5 to 10, we're going to the processing center. That's where all the boxes from all around the country, there's about seven or eight, I don't know how many processing centers where these boxes will come and they'll get sorted by age and by uh, gender. 
they'll make sure that there's not anything that would delay them from customs because sometimes things do get in there that customs says, nope, you can't do that. But it's like Santa's workshop, but even better. It is. So if awesome. you want to be a part of that team going this Friday, stop by the Connection Center today before you leave and say, hey, put my name on that list. Give me a call. Let me know about going to Charlotte from uh, five, 5 to 8, you said? 5 to 10. And five we to actually 10. have a sign-up sheet right up sign here at Round Table. Right. So you go around into the lobby. There's a sign-up sheet. Yep. And you sign to go Friday and help send these boxes. So if you guys would, Bauer, yeah, let's pray over these boxes and over the service.